that uh, have been certainly challenged uh, through the pandemic, uh, through uh, supply chain issues, cost pricing issues, capital issues, uh, PPP programs, and all of the kinds of whirlwinds that are existing in the current business climate. Uh, we absolutely have to take our hats off to those entrepreneurs that have uh, made it through that are looking towards remaining in Illinois, by creating jobs and serving their communities, providing essential products and services uh, to business opportunities wherever they are. And I believe today's meeting is uh, very, very uh, critical and comes at a critical time. But we have to be uh, girded by just the collection of talent that's assembled here is, is really pretty uh, breathtaking. Uh, to have brothers like Jonathan McGee in the position that he's in right now, uh, I tell you, uh, really I can speak, having been, as you said, in the trenches working for economic development and business development for a long time, uh, to have a lineup like we have with Daryl Thomas, with uh, Erica White, uh, to celebrate her uh, ascendance to some place that she has worked at for years, and to have the opportunity to lead the organization right now. Uh, this has to be some information that gets in front of all minority entrepreneurs in the state, that we have people in high places that have uh, done this work, that are committed to this work, that aren't going anywhere until more businesses win this effort uh, of stabilizing themselves, getting strong business opportunities. And as when Jonathan comes up, I'm sure he can't wait to tell you that he's, he, he, he wants nothing more than to see businesses take advantage of the millions and literally billions of dollars that are coming to the state of Illinois at this time. So this is an exciting time to have this convening, and I hope it's not uh, the last time. I know it won't be the last time because everybody uh, on today's meeting has been in conversation throughout uh, the recent months, and we will continue. Uh, just briefly before I enter uh, the panel dialogue, I will say I did put in the chat uh, some information about um, uh, the organization that I'm representing. I am honored and humbled uh, that the governor uh, moved to establish uh, uh, taking advantage of this recent legislation to create uh, the Commission on Equity and Inclusion. And again, this indicates the unique time that we're in is steps are being taken to really, uh, some laws have been on the books for a while. We've had minority participation goals on the books in the state of Illinois for a long time. Illinois has led in some of these areas, but we know there's more work to be done. So this Commission on Equity and Inclusion is here to bring new life to this work of equity, particularly in the areas of procurement, but in many areas. Uh, but people need to recognize Illinois is a large and complicated state. We have the university system. We have the various transportation departments, IDOT and the tollway. We have uh, 70 different buying agencies. We have four chief procurement officers. We have, uh, I don't know how many uh, agency procurement offices. And this new entity, the Commission on Equity and Inclusion, is here to make sure that all of these agencies have a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens when it comes to spending state dollars in ways that empower and impact our communities. So I'm going to need everyone uh, on today's call to begin to uh, not only pray for us, but support us uh, to, to hear and find out what we're doing, to attend some of the meetings. There is still something called the Business Enterprise Program, which uh, for my money represents one of the most phenomenal uh, business opportunity programs in the entire country and certainly the state of Illinois, because the state of Illinois with over a $40 billion budget and some $100 billion that passes through the state from various federal programs, uh, the BEP program certifies minority businesses and it's about to take a new tack of being a real community enabler for uh, economic empowerment and, and fairness and equity and contracting opportunities. And we intend to do our job and do it very well, but we can only do it with your support, with your paying attention to what we're doing. So when we bring transparency, enforcement, and uh, uh, support for this program, it will be because of the support we get from our community, which is you. So I'll start uh, right off and ask each of the panelists 
to uh, make a brief comment about this notion of procurement equity. Uh, you know, Daryl Thomas, uh, you've been in the, the trenches for a long time. Uh, Illinois' PTAC program is arguably uh, one of the best PTAC programs in the country, again. And even though it was started to focus on Illinois getting its fair share of federal procurement, uh, we really need the PTACs to be helpful today in, in making procurement equity the law of the land in the state of Illinois and helping businesses understand what it means to do business with places like the state of Illinois, uh, Cook County government, uh, the various cities and towns and municipalities. Speak to, you know, if you would uh, care to, your experience about this notion of procurement equity and how the PTACs can play a role and leveling the playing field and creating more pathways to opportunity for diverse businesses and black businesses in particular. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Montgomery. I have the utmost respect for your, your tenure and your experience and, and thank you so much for uh, the intro um, and laying the groundwork here. It's it, uh, procurement equity is critical. It's critical. It's the uh, procurement is the, Lifeblood of of our of our communities, uh, government contracting supports uh, is a game changer and it supports equity and uh, building up communities. Uh, government buys everything from toilet paper to rockets, and we know that government spends billions of dollars every year. And for us not to make sure that government is uh, spending its fair share in diverse communities and communities of color. It's it it it's going to only push uh, the the turnaround for minority communities that much further off, and it's time for us to really focus on equity and procurement, and and the PTAC program has worked very hard to make sure that we've done so. Uh, we've actually within the last two years, even during the pandemic, we added two new PTECs in in uh, diverse communities. We have the Far South Community Development Corporation actually has a PTEC now. We have Greater Southwest Development Corporation on the southwest side of Chicago actually has a PTEC now. And one of the goals in us receiving the additional funds, federal funds, was to make sure that we leverage those funds to make sure that we're expanding those resources to the communities that. Uh, that really need to be a part of uh, need these um, valuable services and these critical services to understand procurement. Uh, procurement equity, as you mentioned, the question is uh, how important is it, or what we, we speak to it. It's, it's our lifeblood. It's the reason why we exist as PTEX is to help businesses understand what it takes to do business with government. And not only that, but those who have uh, the best opportunities to bring in new innovative resources to community have to have those opportunities. And there's no better resource than a PTEC to make sure that those businesses have that opportunity, have access to the opportunities and be able to compete for those. Uh, one of our best resources is our bid match profile, our bid match uh, system. We can actually work with a small business, understand what resources and tools they or resources, uh, services and, and products they have and for government and make sure that they get those um, proactive uh, responses or, or solicitations emailed to them so that they can actually bid on those and they can work with us and we can help them to understand the process from soup to nuts, everything that has to do with procurement. That's what the PTEC does. So ju just to be clear, um, because again, uh, when PTACs were first assembled in Illinois, a, a lot of the focus was on federal contracting opportunities, um, 8A programs, other programs to, to line people up to do business with places. And because Illinois has a lot of federal uh, exposure, we have uh, Argonne and Fermi Laboratories from the Department of Energy. We have the Rock Island Arsenal. We have the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So, um, uh, we used to have Scott Air Force Base down in the southern part of Illinois. I'm not sure what's going on down there now. So there's a lot of federal dollars along with GSA that has a big, uh, you know, Chicago is home to region five of the federal government. But also do PTAX uh, understand and look at the opportunities coming from state contracting opportunities and making sure that you understand things like bid buy and the various procurement platforms. Are those things that our businesses can get technical assistance at PTAX to get on the rolls and track some of the opportunities the same way you track them in the federal sector, track them in the local state government sector as well. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, our bid match system looks at 2,000 listservs and bulletin boards and, and agencies to make sure that we get those opportunities that, that we we have those. And uh, commonly, our, our PTEX will work with local government agencies and, and have uh, resource uh, opportunities and, and outreach um, sessions for the, the city of Chicago, Cook County, and, and so forth and so on. So we do everything from local government contracting, state contracting, and federal contracting. Uh, we're funded by the Department of Defense primarily, but we help all entities that are responsible or interested in doing government contracting. And we try to make sure we have those inroads with those local entities because the, the federal government, as you mentioned, invested in this program back in 1985, and it was to build up capacity. They know for businesses to be able to compete on the on the national level at the federal level, they need some past performance at the local and state level in order to be able to compete and do business at the federal level. And so starting those businesses, starting at the local um, uh, park district or, or, or small contracts like that can be the, the entryway into larger, more lucrative contracts. But working with a PTEC is the first step in understanding and identifying um, any contract that the, the business would be able to qualify to to be the bid on. Well, I really appreciate your continued success and leadership and and the goal of the uh, Office of Minority Economic Empowerment and our African American uh, business uh, committee community is to really steer more folks to you. So that they understand, you know, a lot of businesses that come into the space aren't familiar with the infrastructure that's already here. And they don't realize that, you know, the, the wide variety of points of uh, inroad to doing business with the government, the PTAS can be a single point of connection to begin to understand what that road looks like and narrow the focus so that it could be real matching of competencies and capabilities. And like you say, uh, you've got to have some track record of what you've done. And so don't think you can immediately go to the Pentagon. You might want to start with Rock Island Arsenal and, and get some business under your belt that allows you to go further. Uh, Mr. Buckles, I'd like to talk with you because, um, you know, many people felt that during the pandemic, uh, if, you know, places like McCormick Place was silent, it was quiet, but now it's starting to come back with a vengeance. And what does this really mean in terms of business opportunity for small business? How, how what, what does procurement equity look like in the convention and trade area where there's so many moving pieces with unions, with, with, with management, but with private entities that are coming in and the ones that are really putting on the events, how are you able to not only drive conversations with your spin, but with the millions and again, millions and millions of dollars that come through your facility on the part of show producers? Well, yeah, there are a lot of moving parts during at the beginning of the pandemic. The McCormick place was actually closed. So you are correct about that. We were silent lights out, um, you know, but now that we're back in business and shows are revving in, you know, it's, it's all about concentrating businesses to the right areas. So, 1, uh, I oversee the operational purchases um, at the McCormick place. And so I'm always connecting with uh, minority and women businesses specifically to to notify them of opportunities. Uh, in regards to equity, you know, it's about knowing exactly, I think the most difficult thing for us is getting businesses to realize that we do come in layers. You know, the McCormick Place, we give people a place to host their event, but we don't actually put on the shows. You know, they need to be able to co uh, connect with the, the show orchestrators, you know, the people who are going to to build out those shows. And so, you know, the most that I can do on my side is connect them with teams like our sales teams, our marketing teams, so they can start building those partner relationships. But when it comes to the actual bids of uh, being a part of the shows, they actually need to still connect with the direct uh, show creators. And I think that um, for any business of any size, sometimes that's a little bit difficult because they think that we're a one-stop shop, you know? So I think that uh, a big piece of, you know, being equitable is, one having the knowledge of the organization that you're you're trying to participate with, you know everything isn't available on bid by. You know right now we don't use bid by. You know you need to connect with me to see what we do. You know we we post our things our uh, our things our procurements online. Uh, we send them out directly to our vendors that are registered to do business with us. You know, um, but there might be some opportunities that people are looking for, but they're not actually looking to participate on or looking or know how to get on that. So really. Um, 
you know, I feel as though that the McCormick place has a very equitable process, but I also feel as though vendors need to take it upon themselves to kind of understand our organization. We have no problem talking with anybody about any facet of our organization, but they need to, to have that knowledge instead of just saying, oh, you know, McCormick place doesn't have the opportunity. Um, McCormick place is, is uh, prohibited by union participation. Chicago's a big union town. We're not the only one with those type of requirements, you know? Vendors need to put themselves in position to be able to play ball on all levels. Once uh, minority businesses get a, a foot in the door with whatever size contract, have you seen minority business been, be able to stay, grow, and scale and create long-term relationships with your, with your buying entity? So with McCormick Place, have some minority vendors and Black vendors in particular been able to get their foot in the door and you see that they've been there one, two, three, four years Absolutely. doing quality work and finding contract renewal and using that as a way to stabilize their uh, financial relationship with McCormick Place. Absolutely. We have minority and women contractors that have done business with us for over a decade, not just one or two or three years. You know, once you're actually able to get in the door, once you're actually able to pass the bid or the RFP process, the most important part from there is relationship building. One doing the job, doing the job well, and then keeping a relationship with the people that are there. You know, in public procurement, it's a revolving door. You know, our contracts go out four or five years, and then it's time to put it back on the streets and open it up to other competitors. But I do see that having that relationship uh, with our staff, with our team, with our management, you know, it helps, it increases your, um, your perception to the team when it's time to evaluate the scores, you know, we have a better understanding of your capacity, your professionalism and your work ethic. You know, everything isn't always just the lowest, the lowest cost and we go with them. You know, I, I've had a couple of procurements where minority and women businesses have been a lot higher uh, than the, than the cheapest bidder, but they were still able to win based off of their proposal and how they presented themselves and the relationships that they have built. Now, you mentioned management, and I know in the last couple of years, uh, you now have a CEO who's African-American, and yes. she's one who also uh, worked her way up the ranks from finance and accounting all the way now to the CEO spot. Exactly. Having her in that position, has that made a difference with procurement equity? Because now senior management has an interest in seeing uh, part equitable participation. Has that made it a good environment for uh, your work and for the work uh, of connecting with community and connecting with uh, more opportunities in the industry? Most definitely. CEO Larita Clark is one, she is a champion of diversity. I mean, one, she is a black woman uh, herself, you know, so it creates uh, a different climate, a different atmosphere. You know, it's more of an expectation that we deliver. You know, there's really there's really no reason. You know, there's really no no barrier. Um, it makes a more open forum within our organization to bring diversity related topics, not just on the supplier diversity standpoint, but diversity inclusion in general. So definitely having her in that position has helped not just the McCormick Place the NPA, but also our neighboring entities. You know, we do business with a lot of different. You know, there are three hotels on our campus. You know. There are three, we have the Chew Chicago uh, Tourism, we have Saver, which is uh, food distribution. So, you know, we, we all fly under this McCormick flag, this team flag, and having uh, CEO Clark at the helm is kind of like, hey, we have to deliver. You know, we have goals, we have policies set in place, but there's really no reason why we shouldn't be active, why we can't openly say what we want to say and not feel comfortable saying it. Well, I, I really appreciate you saying that, and we really admire uh, CEO Larita Clark uh, to be in these positions. And this is what makes me so excited about uh, the timing that we have right now, because both on this call today, we see people in place like yourself uh, that are at the right place at the right time. And so we as a community have to be taking these opportunities seriously. This has not always been like this. Uh, there's not always been an Alex Buckles in, sitting in the seat that you're sitting in. So we've got to be aggressive how we take advantage of this. And moving over to Jonathan, um, you know, this is a singular point in time with this infrastructure uh, resources coming. Um, you know, not there, you know, in the, in the milieu of the political uh, hot air 
sometimes uh, it gets lost, but this isn't a regular situation. <laughs> this is a very unique time. And so now we've got to gird ourselves to take advantage of that. And, and I know Matthew coming into this hot seat, if you will, uh, at this particular time, but well prepared to let us know, you know, what does procurement equity look like when millions of dollars are coming on board? People want to move fast to take advantage of it. How do we make sure that it doesn't happen so fast that it, uh, we we're on the sidelines? What, what do you, what, what, how are you structuring in ways in which uh, we're, we can both play catch up, but also make sure that we're not steamrolled by people running towards the money that's coming to Illinois and infrastructure spending? Thanks so much for that, Bruce. And, and I actually want to take a step back and say I came to IDOT because what I, I learned at DCEO was uh, that first we got to start with awareness and preparedness. And so many of our communities miss out on opportunities because they're simply not aware. And then once they become aware, you know, then they don't know where to go to get prepared. And so what I'm going to spend my time talking about is how we can educate you on how you can contract, not just with IDOT, but across all the various entities that Bruce mentioned um, and two, how do we translate this? Because this is very technical, uh, in the weeds, complex stuff, right? And our everyday communities are not exposed to it. And once we kind of translate this, how do we activate you all to become champions around this work? So a couple things, you've heard a lot of acronyms and I wanna kind of break those down for you. So you're gonna hear a lot of MBE, WBE, BEP, DBE. Let me kind of articulate, right, what that really means. First and foremost, uh, the DBE program, that's a federal uh, certification that you receive from the US Department of Transportation. It means the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Certification. What's great about that, and due to the advocacy and work of Bruce, is that now under Senate Bill 1608, if you get the DBE certification, you automatically get BEP certified. And then on top of that, if you get BEP certified, you're automatically certified to do business with Chicago and Cook County. So, really, the DBE certification is the gold standard. And many folks look at it, right, as simply a construction certification. However, when we think about IDOT, we don't just talk touch highways. We're not just roads and bridges. We've got aeronautics. We've got transit. We've got ports. We've got bike lanes, right? And so, when we talk about the billions of dollars that are coming down through Rebuild Illinois, which Governor Pritzker signed into legislation in 2019 or President Biden's Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, every part of this plan is centered on equity. However, we need to ensure that you all are prepared to take advantage of it. And so with that being said, part of what my shop does in the Office of Business and Workforce Diversity is one, collaborate with the PTACs, collaborate with the Small Business Development Centers, work with the Office for Minority Economic Empowerment, and our regional economic development team to really come together and help everyone understand that you're not in this alone. One of the biggest issues I see is that we're always going for opportunities without getting support. Daryl, Erica, myself, as well as Matt and other folks seriously are the wraparound services that you need. And so what I say is before you start to think about bidding for an IDOT contract or bidding for um, a procurement through bid buy or you know, looking at a federal opportunity, come talk to us, come talk to our team. And what we're gonna do is first ensure that you have uh, the management um, support in terms of business plans um, and all of the, the items you need to make sure that you're successfully marketing yourself and setting yourself up for an opportunity. And then two, we're then gonna help you understand how you navigate the complexities of an IDOT letting, right, or bid buy. And so then when we think about the legislation, right, that's coming down, um, this is a, a five to six year plan. So this money, Bruce, is gonna come out over the next five to six years. And all the federal money did was supercharge the rebuild Illinois dollars that were already coming. And so what does this look like for black businesses? Well, one, if you're in construction, whether that's electrical, whether that's heavy highway, uh, whether that's trucking, whether that's excavating, um, come to us to get DBE certified. If you're not DBE certified, then you can't do business with IDOT. And the reason why I say you should come to IDOT, because again, we're in what we call a UCP, a Uniform Certified Plan, where the city of Chicago, Metra, PACE, um, 
and uh, all of those entities along with IDOT all share the same certification kind of directory. And that's all public. So that's a free marketing tool for you so that folks that are looking for uh, black and brown contractors to do work for them, um, they can go there. But again, if you get IDOT certified, we also provide supportive services for folks that want to do work with IDOT. And that includes uh, providing technical assistance uh, around, again, business plans, accounting, marketing, software. It's also reimbursement programs we offer. We'll give you 50% for up to 50% for any certification class or training you need, website development, um, as well as um, helping you think about how do you really set up your bidding support. And then, and that's up to $1,500 and we haven't exhausted those funds. Um, but again, more importantly, um, we wanna also help you understand that it's not just you know traditional construction. When you look at the O'Hare Terminal 5 project, or you look at some of the major transit projects on the CTA, some of that is janitorial services. Some of that is IT. Some of that is trucking, right? Um, and so again, what I really want you all to see in terms of this equity piece is, whether it's at the McCormick Place, the City of Chicago, Cook County, IDOT, um, or the state agencies, we are here to set you up for success. And there's goals on all of this. And many times what we see is, we don't see the bids. We don't see the outreach. And everyone's heard this statement from me. Nothing comes to a sleeper but a dream. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And we can't, we can't want to eat and not hunt, right? And so in a lot of ways, that is what we're here to help you all do is figure out how do you actually start to put your best foot forward to win work um, and not just throw your hat out there in the ring and hopefully it catches on to something. And so, you know, again, Bruce and Matt, thank you for bringing all of us together because between everyone on this panel, there is dollars out there. Um, and it's dollars across the state. So it's not just Chicago and Cook County, right? Um, we've got 102 counties. We've got state entities. He mentioned the Rock Island Arsenal. We've got America's Central Port. We've got the Cairo Port Project. We've got, again, Mid-America Airport. Um, we also have uh, the Metrolink extension in the Metro East near East St. Louis, all the way to the I-80 and 290 uh, projects and the Jane Byrne Interchange uh, that we're working on, as well as the 274 interchange in Champaign. And so what the governor put out was a $34.6 billion plan over six years that lays out the jobs and the projects that we're going to do. And so once you see those projects and jobs, you should definitely reach out to us so that we can help you navigate what makes the most sense for your business. Now, Jonathan, thank you for that uh, illustrious overview. This is a very unique time. For those that aren't familiar, there are some structures within IDOT that are uh, deeply committed to technical assistance, pre-bid technical assistance. So a lot of times people say uh, with these various uh, pronouncements and announcements that it's, it's a lot of hoopla in the beginning, but the transparency seems to fade away uh, quarter over quarter, year over year. Uh, I'd like to dig into the weeds a little bit on how uh, from this point forward, uh, each of you are doing things to make, uh, the, the, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, we can't participate if we don't know how to participate. And I'd like you to speak specifically about how your entity is making transparency and monitoring a part of its effort. I know at the uh, Commission on Equity and Inclusion, we are tasked with generating scorecards and dashboards where we've been looking at utilization plans for years of agencies that commit to the minority participation. They start out at the beginning of the year with a goal. Uh, there are certain dollars within their budget that are subject to goal, but oftentimes at the end of that calendar year or fiscal year, those goals, while aspirational, were nowhere close to being achieved. And so this is where we need to have a new uh, yardstick of consistent monitoring and transparency around these kinds of business opportunities. So we don't hear about all the money coming in. We need to be able to uh, clearly and concisely keep track of this. And this is, this is hard work. This is why we need the support of a PTAC that's looking at these bids because these things come fast and furious and it could literally overwhelm any business of any size, let alone a small five man, 10 man, 50, 15 man company that's trying to get their legs under them, figuring out what's going on. So let's talk about what each of us are doing to make transparency 
a part of our process and inform our community so that they can have some pre preparation for getting in line to do some business in the various areas we've been talking about. I have to go back to Daryl because that's kind of what PTACs are all about. How do you uh, get people in the flow of information so that they can make good business decisions while they're going through the steps of looking at BEP certification, GATA certification, uh, DBE certification, and do you provide hands-on technical assistance going through these various certification steps at the PTAX? Absolutely, Bruce. Absolutely. Um, all of the above. I, I, I'm just reeling with a whole bunch of thoughts that, that I wanted to just share with you, but I'll, I'll jump in as quickly as I can. Uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Buckle said earlier is uh, it's all about relationships. And so we want to make sure that um, those businesses that are coming to a PTEC actually form that relationship so that the PTEC understands exactly what their goals are, what their vision and their mission are with government, with regard to government contracting. Because you can have a dream, as, as Jonathan said, but you have to put in the work in order to make the dream become a reality. And the work that is there is, is working directly with the PTEC to identify the opportunity. And one of the things that makes me cringe is when, when we hear a lot of people tell people, go get every certification that you possibly can get. That doesn't help a business. A business needs to have a strategic plan. They need to know exactly who they want to do business with, who buys their products, who, who is interested in working with them, and who will be a best partner for them. Just because you get a contract doesn't mean that that's a good contract or it's a good opportunity for the business. One of the worst things a business can do is win a contract and not be able to fulfill on it or be able to get paid at the end of it. And so we want to uh, help businesses understand that cultivating that relationship with a PTEC is critically important to identify what certifications, registrations, and opportunities would be best for them to achieve uh, their end goal. Uh, and and when, you, when you're in this market or when you're looking for government contracting, you need to have that. You need to start with the end in mind. You need to know exactly what direction you want to go into, what success looks like. And the PTEC can help them to identify what success looks like. We have a ton of resources that we make available, resources that would cost uh, business thousands of dollars to have access to. They have access to a PTEC free of charge. They can work with a PTEC, identify those contracts, identify incumbents, those who have those contracts in those areas that you want to do business with. They can get um, past performance data or data that uh, can actually help them to understand what an appropriate bid would look like. It's really important that, as I said before, that we we work with businesses to identify, to create a timeline, to create a game plan and a strategy so that we can expedite their time. Because as you mentioned, a lot of our small businesses don't have the resources. They don't have an, a, a liber, a, an elaborate procurement team that will go looking at contracts and be able to bid on it. And so when they're bidding on contracts, they need to make sure it's something that they that that's worthwhile and worth them to put the forth the effort to be able to win and secure and be able to fulfill it on the back end. And so those things are really critically important. Uh, time is 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 of essence for our, our small businesses and wasting time or spending time or procurement opportunities that aren't best suited for them is definitely not something that that we would recommend. And that's why working with a PTEC is really critical so that you can understand and put forth the best effort. Uh, Alex, at your shop, what are you doing to uh, provide a level of transparency and also uh, opening up so that people can look at past activities and understand what the level of participation has been on some of these kinds of opportunities? So is, uh, do, do you guys have a, uh, an annual report that you prepare that looks at your procurements across the different areas and look at MBE participation? And do you have some kind of uh, dashboard or analytics that look at where you've done well with MBE uh, uh, and then break it down even further to talk about black business so we can see, you know, because sometimes uh, MBE or DBE doesn't tell us how uh, black owned companies are doing. And so do you have any data at your disposal that allows us to get an understanding of where black businesses are doing well within your procurement process at uh, uh, Metropolitan Pier? Yes, yes, we do. So we do, uh, we do a quarterly and annual report on um, our supplier diversity program. Now, we don't actually post it on our website, but anytime we start talking about transparency, I always want to point out one thing. 
and that's FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. I prepare all of these documents. So I have no problem sending them to anybody, but you just got to put it in the FOIA, which is uh, if anybody's looking to FOIA us now, mpa.com, and then go to our FOIA section. <clears throat> but with any government entity, you could FOIA any piece of information that you would like. And I always encourage uh, my small and diverse businesses to FOIA the opportunities that you that you want to go for. If you want to get on a window cleaning contract, housekeeping, if there's a, a supply contract that you want, FOIA the bid results. FOIA what happened on the last RFP opportunity. I, I will sit down and talk with you once you do the FOIA. You, you'll get the document, <clears throat> you can review it, and then we can talk about, okay, what happened? What what does this mean? Do that before the opportunity is actually released. You know, if I'm telling you that we're going to go out for a particular agreement or a contract at the end of the year, FOIA me now, you know, because once that opportunity is on the street, that's not the time to FOIA. You know, you got to FOIA me now because once it's out on the street, it's already, I, I can't talk to you about it anymore, you know? Um, and you you can ask your questions. You know, we go around, uh, I like to kind of call it like the chilling circuit. Like there's a lot of different events that we hit, a lot of different outreach events. See, everybody's doing something. We put our we put our opportunities along with the city of Chicago, state of Illinois, into a giant procurement um, booklet that's dispersed through the city of Chicago through the GPC, the Government Procurement Committee. Um, and then we also will post anything that's on our website right now is an active opportunity. So the best way to kind of hear about what's coming in the future is to one, get a hold of the city's buying plan or the GPC buying plan, and to two, to contact uh, McCormick Place Purchasing directly to see if, you know, what you provide is something that we plan on buying in the future. And then I cannot drill it in even further. With a FOIA, you can literally see bid tabulations. You can see what, you know, the other proposer, what service that they provided. You know, even if there might be an opportunity that you actually lost out on, you can see, well, where did you fall short? And that's what big businesses do. You know, we, we get FOIA, we get we get protests, people raise this thing, or they just want to know more information about, well, what happened? Where did we miss the mark? And I think that's one thing that I would like to see a lot more smaller businesses do, because I rarely get a FOIA from a small business about a particular opportunity, whether they participated in the last one or not. Well, you put some inside baseball information out on the table today. Because again, this is a complex game. There are billions of dollars at stake. Um, you know, nobody's going to open up the playing field just because you show up. You're going to have to understand how to uh, do the things you have to do and getting that information uh, by any means necessary. And FOIA is a good way to get it. Uh, and we also, again, have to um, in inform ourselves of what the process is in terms of fiscal year, in terms of how budgets are established, uh, when certain things are coming up so that we can be prepared and, and know where we really fit in. Every agency is not a good fit for every business. Uh, you, you know, you may have a particular uh, service that's not in line with that particular one. So you have to, again, that's why the PTAX could be so helpful of helping you figure out where the best uh, place to focus your effort at. And even when you do that, it's still going to be a lead up time before you start getting in sync and really understanding who the players are and, and seeing if those are the kind of people you can create the relationship with that can move you to the next level of success. Now, you know, Jonathan, we all know that there are people that have been in the benefit of getting contracts from our major entities year after year after year. We call them prime contractors. Uh, they're only prime because they've been around so long and they've allowed to become very skilled at this game. And, and oftentimes they are the proverbial gatekeepers because a prime has to make sure that there's subcontracting opportunities. Uh, what is your agency doing to cultivate a positive activity on behalf of primes for equity to be a part of that posture? Now, it's one thing to have the laws on the book and say it's the law of the land, but it's another thing to have good actors. Is there some way that your shop is trying to cultivate good actors on the part of primes to not just say, okay, I know it's a requirement and I got to check a box, but they're doing it because they want to really help to build capacity. And, you know, right, right now, there's a labor shortage. Uh, there's a human capital shortage. There, there's a, a, a backlog because there are not enough people capable of doing this work because 
they've been sequestered from doing this work. And so some of the primes are suffering from their lack of inclusion and farsightedness to, to bring people along and empower them. If they would have done that work 10 years ago, they would be in a position to double the amount of business they're doing because they would have subs that's up at a different level, but because they didn't do it, they don't have those subs with those kinds of capabilities. Are you having those kinds of conversations with primes about their responsibility and equity as well? Yeah, and, and this is such a great question. I'm actually in South Carolina right now with the National Association of State Transportation Officials to discuss right with the Federal Highway Administration, FAA and FTA about how we can make sure that the regulations are designed to help more people come in as opposed to keep more folks out. Um, and I think you're 100% right, Bruce. Um, I just want to give somebody, a, some folks a quick history lesson. 50, 60 years ago, uh, USDOT didn't even recognize that transportation was an economic development tool. Um, next, now, we've seen for the first time Secretary Pete acknowledge that we know that highways and transportation systems have disproportionately impacted black and brown communities and indigenous communities. This is a historic time because what our transportation equity says is not just do we understand this, but we're going to do better. And so we do have transparency, transparency and accountability measures in a couple ways. My office is comprised of compliance and certification and supportive services and workforce, and then civil rights. And many of you all are familiar with the Federal Civil Rights Act, which enshrines and codifies and statute your rights to Title VI. That means ADA, sexual harassment, um, racial discrimination, and this is all confidential. So if you're a worker on an IDOT job, if you're a subcontractor on an IDOT job and you're not being treated fairly, there is a anonymous process that you can go through to make sure that we fully investigate it. You know, I hear a lot of folks talk about we need to sue the government. Well, there's there's protections in place in government to protect you. So I want to talk about that. Let's talk about transparency. Our, we have lettings. So at IDOT, they have a lot of terminologies. Lettings is when we put out projects for bid, right? So we have about 13 to 14 lettings a year. And when these come out, these are public, they're on our website. It shows you the authorized bidders, which are the primes. So there's authorized bidders and unauthorized bidders. And then once we award the contract, that's all also public. And then we have what we call a utilization plan, which Bruce mentioned that my office approves, checks the goals on and ensures that it's in alignment with our equity goals. Illinois has the highest DBE goal in the nation at 20.27%. And we have that because we know how important it is to ensure that under this historic plan that we actually have equity that represents the state. And so, um, Bruce, we always can do better, um, but anybody that knows me knows I'm not afraid to tell you the numbers. And we're not doing well in the black business contract community. A lot of it is, right, primes not necessarily uh, selecting DBEs or using the same DBEs or using the same vendors, but a lot of it is, again, um, us not understanding how to navigate the process. And that's why we're here today, because guess what? There's rules about what primes can and can't do, right? We can't tell a prime who to use. We can't tell them what the subcontract, but we can put a goal on their project based on subcontractable items and ensure that they're following the federal regulations. Another thing that my team does on the EEO and labor side, many of you all may see the highways and say, they don't look like me. Right? We send folks out to the jobs to make sure that they're following the DOL EEO standards. And if not, we do corrective action plans and we evaluate them accordingly. The other thing that we do is what we call commercially useful function, where we go to different job sites. And if it's Bruce Montgomery trucking on the site, then we're good. But if it's Jonathan McGee trucking, that's an issue. And we ask those questions and we may even pull goal credit and have them write us a check. Right? So I just want to talk about some of that enforcement and accountability that just folks have never been aware of because we just don't educate folks enough about it. When we do public participation on our goal methodologies, on our civil rights um, kind of inquiries, when we're doing a big project and it's going through your neighborhood or you know, environmental issues or you know, your house is gonna be subject to a right of way and land acquisition, we wanna make sure that we're thinking about every of this before we actually approve that project. And so I will call out and say, we want to make sure you all are participating in that. Last but not least, right now, under the Biden and Harris administration, they're looking to change the federal DBE program regulations and the ACDBE program regulations, which that's just airport concessions um, in O'Hare and Midway. But the public comment period is open to September 19th, and I'll drop that information in. But Bruce, our numbers right here are at nine 
contractor participation, and that's not enough. And let me tell you why. If you all read the McKinsey report that came out two years ago, it talked about how black businesses are concentrated in the same industry and pay codes. I repeat, we're concentrated in the same work categories, pay items, and pay codes, which means that all of the, the work, whether it's asphalt, milling, drilling, drainage, or it's, it's opportunities that aren't, for example, striping, landscaping, um, you know, uh, professional services, you know, then we're never going to get a bite at the apple because it's a chicken and an egg, right? And so part of this is we're also doing workforce programs to make sure we can cultivate DBEs that have the skill set. So we have a highway construction career training program. We partner with community colleges across the state. We've graduated 3,100 pre-apprentices. 50% of them are black men, and we place 63% of them uh, in the trades, right? So when they become journeymen, what I need is, is for Bruce. I need for Daryl. I need for Matt. I need for Erica. Helping these folks say, hey, look, you want to do this at a subcontractor level? You've got experience that we currently don't have in the DBE community. In addition to that, we need more DBE on DBE mentoring and prime and DBE networking. The reality is, is this, you know, the big prime contractors, if you don't reach out to them, if you don't come to our workshops, if you're not building that relationship, then it's going to be very hard to see success. And, and I think that's the piece that I want to focus on. Because again, if they're being bad actors, I gave you your remedies. However, if you never reach out or you're not looking at the lettings or you're not assessing to Daryl's point where your sweet spot is, right? Because these NAICS codes are so broad, right? What do they really mean? In landscaping, do you mow lawns and do, you know, seeding and sodding? Or do you do something a little bit different around shrubbery, right? Like, I mean, this is how nuanced it gets. And so that's why when Daryl says, find your sweet spot, He's 100% right because, again, while, yeah, you don't want to just go get a bunch of certifications for the sake of getting certifications, you do want to understand what that certification affords you. Um, and so with that, I think for me right now, it is a significantly historic time at IDOT because we put the goals in place. We also unbundle projects. So I'll give you an example. One time we put a litter picking contract on the Dan Ryan. We unbundled it. The business couldn't get bonding and insurance assistance. So when we talk about access to capital, capacity building, these are the things that we really need to spend a lot of time talking about before we go out for bid. Because this is the other issue that happens. If an issue happens where we drop the ball, we don't deliver on a service, that only feeds to this narrative that we know is not true, which is that we know that we can perform this work. However, we got to make sure we put our best foot forward. And so, you know, with that, I'll leave you with this stat. During the pandemic, when we saw a lot of businesses struggling, 80% of our businesses that we surveyed were micro enterprises. And many of them were five employees or less. So they're the janitor, they're the accountant, they're the owner, they're the bidder, they're the salesperson. And so your time is money. And so you do have to think strategically about if I don't do highway construction, then maybe I can do BEP work with IDOT because we spend a lot of money there. Marketing contracts, you know, janitorial contracts, all types of different items. So, you know, I think the big takeaway for a lot of you all is, you know, there is opportunity. We got small business set asides. We just need you to come to us so we can help work through that with you. Well, Jonathan, what I'm hearing is there's a lot of opportunity, but I think we that are on the inside have to provide some analytics that direct people in particularly an area that you're talking about. The, you use the term NIGP codes, and for the city and the county, they use uh, NAICS codes. And these are codes where when you become certified as a business, you say what your specialty area is, and then you go into one of these coding schemes. And this has been particularly challenging because of the different variations of how coding is used between um, these different coding formats. But here's my point. I, I think that what we need to do is ferret out where there is wide greenfield opportunity and little participation in and educate our community around growing areas like in the, in the transportation area. A lot of something that's never existed before are electric vehicles. 
And the state is making a big push to be a major player in electric vehicles. We've got Rivian as a manufacturer. We've got Stellion that's here in the state as well. And then certain, and the dollars that are coming to the state to put EV charging, because if you looked at where EV chargers are right now, it would look like they're avoiding the black community like the plague. Uh, they're everywhere but where we are. So how can there be equity in adopting electric vehicles if there's no chargers in diverse communities? So the lens that is coming with some of the dollars is saying, we've got to reverse the deployment of these things. Well, now, you know, if somebody is a electrical contractor, they, uh, they know how to do high voltage and low voltage work. They know how to do site preparation. They're in project management and professional services for commissioning and identifying and doing the demographic data to figure out where these things should be located. They have a chance to play a role. And, and we can't say that there's an existing incumbent because this has never been done before. So we've got to uh, take our time uh, on the agency side to really look at where some of the new opportunities are being generated and publicize that through channels like our uh, Office of Minority Economic Empowerment, our chambers, our PTAX, so we can start pulling people's coat, if you will, to get into some of these greenfield opportunities where the real growth and equity is. Like you say, somebody may be uh, two guys in a truck and that kind of worked out well at a certain level, but they may be one of you know, two guys and, and some new kind of electric device that's able to do some things that nobody's been doing before. And we know that those numbers are gonna grow year over year. So Daryl, I'd like to go back to you as we start to wrap up before we take questions from uh, our audience and say, if, if you could uh, encourage people to take a certain step forward and how to best engage your agency, what would you recommend they do? Obviously, you know, to, to call and go in and have a meeting, but what are some of the things they need to come prepared with as they start to engage a PTAC in getting the best out of that experience when they come in the door? Oh, great. That's a, that's a phenomenal question. Thank you, sir. Um, one of the things that I would say, first of all, come ready to learn, come ready to learn and understand and, and, and just be completely open to what the possibilities are and know exactly what your desires are. Uh, if, you, if you're in business, if you have a successful business, then you're ready to make that transition. If, you, if you're having some struggles and some issues with the foundational things or basic structural and development issues, you need to work with the SBDC to build up your capacity and build up your ability. So you gotta be willing to hear those things that you may not want to hear because one of the things that our PTEX try to do and the SBDCs try to do is give it to you straight and help you to understand what the lay of the land is. And so coming there and being willing to hear the things that you may not want to hear, but to receive it and then take that and then run with it. One of the things that you're probably gonna get is some homework. And one of the reasons you get homework is to see how much you're gonna, how much time and energy are you willing to invest in putting uh, what you have received to work and to, to best use. And once you do that, if you do the assignment, if you do what is asked of you, then that is actually going to create that relationship that we talked about, that cultivating that relationship and that going to going back and forth. Uh, for those businesses that are established uh, and ready to do government contracting, uh, come there with an open mind to understand and be able to identify where where your sweet spot is. As uh, as as Jonathan said, we got to make sure that we we deal with businesses on the levels that they are. And we try to build up their capacity and take them to a higher level. One of the things that we're learning is the fact that government, this new area that we're living in, government doesn't even know what it needs. Government doesn't know what it needs. Industry actually is dictating to government what technology is and what's innovative and what's new. Um, we have the federal government giving out contracts, $50,000 contracts uh, to innovative companies that just have prototypes or just have ideas. Government is, is this is a new era and a new time that we're living in and to understand the lay of the land and working with the PTEC can actually help you to get in there. And one of the things that our, our office, the, the PTEC program is actually transitioned from the Defense Logistics Agency to the Office of Small Business Programs. This is a phenomenal opportunity for us. 
we're actually, um, the Department of Defense is actually looking at us partnering all across the country with SBDCs at those innovative firms that may not even have looked at government as a, as a, as a customer before. And now, uh, working with those innovative firms, we can help you understand that there's opportunities for you. So, starting off with a SBDC is critical, uh, building up that capacity, understanding what you're wanting to do and where you want to go, can, and, and let us help you to get to that dir direction and destination. Uh, Alex, I'd like to ask you, is your agency uh, planning um, uh, some, I know you just, in the last couple of months, you've had kind of a procurement of open house uh, where you uh, brought people in and brought some of the assist agencies in. Is that something you're going to do more of so that for people warming up to what it's like to be in your environment, uh, are, are you going to be doing more outreach activities so that people can come to learn what Metropolitan Pier has to offer uh, who some of the prime contractors are, how to get in the flow of what the plans are for the next one to two to three years so that they can see if this is an agency they, they can fit in and find a, a home for their business or service. Sure. So we're actually looking at doing an additional event similar to what we just had uh, over the summer <clears throat> this winter, but we also do lunch and learns. Um, where I, I will invite a, a company, you know, if I find the product or the service to be something that we could use, I'll bring it in front of our, our operations team. You know, if, it, if it's something that could apply to the arena, if it's something that could just apply into building maintenance, you know, I'll bring you in front of a, a manager or, or a director for that department so you can kind of give us your spiel, give us your capabilities. I like what Denise did, and she just kind of laid it right there in the chat. We, we're actively seeking uh, medical suppliers right now. You know, so uh, once again, just saying what you do, and if we have a need for it, I will let you know, and then and we can go from there. But yes, we will be doing a lot more outreach. And and, and also, you know, we uh, many of us on this call today have have seen each other. Uh, you know, the SBDCs have regular events, the PTACs have regular events, and business people sometimes. Say, well, look, you know, if, if I spent all the time going to workshops and events, I wouldn't do any work, you know, uh, because they go on during the day. Uh, they're not necessarily convenient. Uh, are, 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 are we learning some ways to to provide uh, flexible ways we share this kind of information so people can get it when they can get it? Uh, uh, can you talk to some of the ways, uh, uh, Jonathan, you're fortunate because in some of your funding, you guys have split off money that goes into this area. And you have firms like RGMA that are contracted by the transportation department to do some of the very technical assistance, roll up your sleeves, capacity building work that they have, that they're able to do. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, uh, is that something that's going to expand so that when people are saying, look, I recognize that I'm a five man shop. I'm two guys with a truck. I don't always want to be like that. Can you point me in the direction of getting that kind of technical assistance? And you have that kind of capacity. Is that something that's going to expand at the Department of Transportation? So 100%, I'm working on an RFP currently that we're going to hopefully put out um, by the end of the year that's going to expand our technical assistance program. Many of you all are familiar with the community navigator program that Vanessa and I led at DCEO and much of that model I'm looking to adopt here at IDOT because a couple things I know to be true. One thing we're from the government, we're here to help. We need trusted partners like Bruce and others who are going to actually build that credibility for us in our programs. And so um, RGMA is just one consultant. We have over 13 consultants with sub consultants that are here to work for you. Uh, if you want to get certified, they'll help you with your application at any time. Um, again, they'll do an intake assessment with you and you'll get some homework, much like Daryl said. Um, but again, I don't want this happening in a silo, right? So again, I want Daryl, uh, Erica's groups, as well as uh, our consultants working in lock and step so that again, we understand the totality of what your needs are. We're doing workshops in all hours and all uh, times of the day. We've got, of course, our black business contracting panel uh, next Tuesday. Uh, again, we've got Representative Buckner, we've got BOA Construction, which you see their names everywhere. Uh, we've got subcontractors on board. Eric is going to be on that panel, as well as uh, myself um, and leadership. We've got um, what we call a District 1 Resource Center, 
This is on Des Plaines in Chicago, but we have resource centers across the state. We're doing a DBE and Prime networking meet and greet on September 7th, which I'm happy to uh, send out to you all. Um, we're doing an Advantage Illinois uh, webinar about loan participation with DCEO uh, on the 15th. And we're also doing a certification workshop as well um, that's coming up. And so I'll make sure you all get all of that. But we also have a newsletter called the Diversity Depot that we want to make sure all of you all are a part of so that you're hearing and you're signing up for our programs. But I'll do you one even better because what Bruce talked about was, is look, you know, where does the flexibility for me if I'm working all day? The flexibility is reaching out to us and we will set an appointment with you at whatever time that makes sense right now. Of course, you know, it's got to be reasonable here, but, you know, if it's early morning, if it's later in the evening, to be frank with you, if I personally got to do it myself, um, I will. And and I've done that before. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I say that because we are literally here to take advantage of this time because it won't come again. It won't. And I think what's most unfortunate is, is that while we've got a lot going on, the time for black businesses is now. Um, we've got the first black secretary of the Department of Transportation. You've got me in seat. You've got so many leaders uh, across the state that are committed to ensuring that you see economic opportunity. However, we also as a community got to make sure that we're also not competing against each other and cannibalizing each other. Because the one thing I do know to be true is that all, all uh, tides rise all boats, and as my friend Matt likes to say, many hands to make light work. And if you're looking for a prime to show you the tricks of the trade, you're going to be looking for a while, right? So we need DBE on DBE mentoring. We need BOA Construction helping folks to become a prime. You know, we've got Turner Construction on the Obama Foundation project, and they're actually putting out a Turner School of Construction where they're aimed at helping folks understand this. And so we understand what it's like, right? to be in this situation. And so once we become primes or when we're poised to do that, we got our own mentor protege going on. It's happening right here on this webinar and it's gonna continue to happen. And so um, again, that is what we're here to do. That is how we reach out to you all and meet you where you are. Um, whether it's community navigators, whether it's SBDCs, whether it's P-TACs, regional economic development teams or OMI, the, the short answer is, we're here to help, and I'm just excited because I look forward to seeing all of you all on more um, webinars. And, and Bruce, I just thank you for this great um, quality conversation. Well, I want to scoot one more uh, question in before we take some questions from the audience. Uh, you, you know, there are some uh, structures that exist within the state of Illinois, uh, sheltered market programs where we can take our contracting activity and particularly set it aside where only uh, DBE or MBE or BEP businesses can, can bid on it. That way, there is a pool of contracts because if we just keep going down the regular course of, and you mentioned this, of, of unbundling, uh, one of the key vehicles needed to get more contracts in the right size and the right scope that our businesses could sink their teeth into We've got to unbundle some of these huge long-term contracts. And so the sheltered market program or the target market program or set aside program, whatever you want to call it, is a vehicle that can really be successful at sending targeted contract opportunities with the size and the scope that our businesses could best handle. I'd like Alex to know that is that something your agency is looking at, how to have a sheltered or target market program where only uh, DBE, MBE, BEP type firms can compete on? And is that something also going on in the transportation sector? Alex, I'll start with you. Sure, so we actually do have a uh, small business set aside. So ours is on small orders, but they're very frequent transactions. So anything under $10,000 is where we'll kind of uh, target our, our smaller diverse businesses to participate on. Uh, and I think that that's a, it's a pretty great program because one, it puts it puts your name, your company name in front of our staff more often because with our contracts, you know, once again, those come around seeming like a blue moon. We can have a four or five year agreement, but if we're looking at a particular supply where we have a, a reoccurring purchase with an IT product or, or something like that, you know, it's going to be a constant reminder to our, our IT staff that, hey, ABC Tech does this you know, and they might be able to do more. And we've seen a lot of, uh, we've seen a few companies just in this past year really have a lot more involvement on what we do uh, in the procurement world, especially when it comes to a larger contract, because 
the good thing about the frequent transactions in our in our set aside is that by you being more active in what we do on campus, when it comes time for that bigger opportunity, they know your name. They've seen okay. it. You know, so so the set aside and the target sheltered market is a good way to get in the door. Uh, uh, Daryl, let me ask a question of you before I go back to Jonathan with that same question about sheltered market or target market. Do sometimes primes reach out to PTAX to try to get a list of qualified firms when they're looking? Is that something that you help some of the prime firms know who's in your system and available to do some good work? Absolutely, absolutely. We we get notices on a regular basis. I get notices from Wash and other uh, prime contractors on a regular basis to us, and I send them out to our PTEX so to and let them uh, encourage them to identify uh, those prospective businesses that are in their client base. Uh, we we and that's one of the things that PTEX do on a regular basis is to try to make sure that we connect and help primes meet their small business uh, their small business uh, set of great. So great. contracting that's goals. Yeah. Super, super uh, service. And Jonathan, what thought do you have around sheltered market, specialty bids, taking some of those uh, multi-million dollar, billion dollar programs, unbundling them and make them only available for DBE firms to respond to? So what, what we've actually have done is we actually have what we call small business initiatives. And these are projects that are under a million. Um, and these are projects where DBEs can bid as primes. And many times we don't see primes even bid for these because it's not enough money. And so what we see is, again, a lot of DBs don't go after it because they don't know that they don't have to be pre-qualified to bid on it. And if you win work as a prime, what does that do? Help you have more experience and expertise so that when you try to go after another job, you can speak to that experience. And these are jobs that I don't have. The other thing that we can do um, and why I'm at this conference is right now we're doing project-based goals. We can also do contract based goals, so we could do a hybrid model. So, for example, everyone's looking at the I 80 on the I 80 project. We could look at a contract based goal. And try to figure out how do we ensure that we meet that DBE participation? Um, so, in short, some of the, the work as well is. Again, I want to be clear. Yes, it sounds a lot construction focused, but we also have our airport projects. We also have our transit projects and again, once you're in the DBE UCP. You can go to the city of Chicago, you can go to CTA, you can go to Metra, you can go to PACE, and they all will help you identify what those opportunities are. But I also appreciate having Alex here because, again, the Metropolitan period, they're just one entity. There's so many other entities, and they've got their own subcontractor registration, which is a lot more um, flexible. And so I'll give you this last example. When I was, again, at the America Central Port, where my folks near East St. Louis and downstate, they said, Jonathan, we literally can direct our contracts that are under 250,000 to whoever we want, because that is literally their money. And so if you do uh, grounds work, tuck pointing, all types of work, he was like, Jonathan, we are looking for that. And so that's where I go back to, um, again, make sure that you join our listservs, you attend our events, you reach out to us, but we're reaching out to you. And so if we're in your community, we'll be sure to make sure we connect with you. But in short, Bruce, we are looking at unbundling. We're doing the SBIs. We're looking at ways that we can connect folks um, with our transit partners and with our aeronautics partners. Again, if you do concessions, right, let's say you're a vendor, you do hospitality and food. Right now, you could go look at O'Hare's programs and Midway's programs to see if you could get into the airport, right? And again, those are resources that we can provide supportive services on. Well, uh, I think this is a very uh, empowering and inspiring conversation today. I, I want to take my hat off to the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus because I would not be here today if it wasn't for their foresight in creating the legislation that created the Commission on Equity and Inclusion that the governor signed and is now the law of the land. Our commission just uh, uh, came up uh, the first of this year. And, and, it for, and for the first couple of months, it was just our director, Commissioner Kelly Keyes. She was there by herself trying to put the structure in place so that all of this work that we know is so important to do. And so we're a young entity. Uh, fortunately, two more commissioners have been added, myself and Commissioner Entity Rivera to go along with uh, Director Keyes. And we are committed to making this process easy. I see one question here that says, you know, sometimes getting an MBE or a DBE certification seems like the paperwork never ends. 
is always one more document that's needed. And I can tell you right now that our agency, we're trying to uh, narrow that down. And as Jonathan mentioned early on, uh, because of additional laws that were passed, uh, we're going to be able to take uh, anybody that is city of Chicago certified or Cook County certified. You now have a friend at the state of Illinois that wants to bring you into the BEP program and make that process smooth and an easy transition. You still, as 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 uh, Daryl mentioned, you still got to figure out, okay, where, you know, just being certified is no golden key that all of a sudden uh, contracts are going to show up on your doorstep and you start cashing checks. You've got to figure out now that you've done that, how do I get into systems like bid buy? How do I start tracking the RFPs? How do I find out about the small business set asides? And how do I create the relationships so that people know me, they know my name, they know my company, they know my value proposition and what I'm trying to do. And as and I think Alex pointed out something, being around is, is always a good thing, you know, because it seems like when you're around, you're at the right place at the right time and good things can happen. So this, there's a small business set aside program across the entire state where those contracts uh, can be awarded anything under, I think it's 20 or $30 million business gets a chance to participate in those kinds of programs. So there's a lot to this process. Uh, we really are delighted to all be in the seats that we're in doing the work. Again, I wanna give special recognition to uh, our director, Commissioner Kelly Keyes. Uh, she is no bigger advocate for making this process smooth and easy and transparent and with some teeth in it so we can begin to take a look at the huge challenge of the 70 agencies that we will be reviewing, how we can make sure that they are committed to the laws of the land and that what was a 20% goal is now a 30% goal. We've got to make sure that agencies are doing some things. So uh, I, I think some of us on our side of the table with Jonathan and other practitioners we're going to have to get around the table together with each other to learn from each other, to implement best practices, to make our process as transparent as it possibly can be so that uh, you have a chance of winning. And I think today is a testament to the integrity of the process because we have DCEO, we have uh, all of us that have come together over the last several months around the table, figuring out how black businesses can come out on top. And like Jonathan says, this will not, it's happening right now. We don't know if it's gonna happen ever again. So we must take advantage of it in all the ways that we can. And, and uh, we know that where two or more gathered in the right spirit, nothing but goodness and prosperity can come from it because that is what gives us the capability of doing all things perfectly and in order. And with that, I'll hand it back to Matt and he can take a few questions and close us out. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much, man, for your time, for your masterful questions. Um, you know, anybody who knows Bruce, you know, um, we we had a, a document prepared with some with some questions for him to use. And, you know, Bruce remixed it. He added some, his own butter and sugar to it. And he he put some seasoning on it. So you know, you 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 understand that we got something that was very unique, and I think added a lot of value and texture to the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Bruce, man. Just want to give you your flowers. Thank you for serving on our Black Business Collective as well. A um, lot of uh, details shared in this webinar. Everyone needs to know we've been recording it. We started the recording a little late, but everyone will get a copy of this link and a follow-up email. In addition, everyone's contact information in terms of panelists will be shared in a follow-up email as well. Um, so just want people to know that we're at time right now. We're gonna we're gonna push the time a little bit to allow for a couple of questions to be asked. Um, but, but before I get to those questions, I do because we didn't have this happen on the front end. I do just want to acknowledge um, Erica White as the state director of the Illinois Small Business Development Center. I'm gonna get that on the recording. Uh, the first black woman to uh, uh, hold this position. I want to acknowledge Vanessa Uribe, who is the deputy director of the Office of Minority Economic Empowerment, as well as the Department of Commerce Chief of Staff. Um, we didn't get those in the front end on the recording, but just wanna make sure that uh, the recording reflects the, the team that we've pulled together. 
in support of black businesses during Black Business Month. Uh, very important that we all uh, understand that uh, many hands make light work, as my brother Jonathan quoted me as saying. And, um, and we'll be sharing those contacts on the back end. I want to take a couple of questions and then we're going to have some closing remarks from the Deputy Director, Chief of Staff, Uribe. Um, I'm going to cherry pick a couple of questions because I think these few speak to some of the um, things that may be swirling around our heads. Um, Zandy, Zandy Shields asked a great question. Um, a lot of information was presented. Um, what steps are recommended for people to have prepared ahead of uh, pursuing some government work? So before I go pursue a government opportunity, what do I need to have prepared? And just kind of offer a little bit of brevity, if you can, in your responses. I'll start with Brother uh, Daryl Thomas from the PTAC. Uh, the first time I met uh, Mr. Uh, Montgomery, uh, he, he, he was emphasizing how important it is for minority businesses to be excellent, to have a spirit of excellence in all that they do. I think that's the number one thing. If you're going to be successful in business or in government contracting, you need to be the very best that you can be in the line of work that you do, because that is actually going to set the standard for getting more contracts and getting more customers in. Go government is just another customer, and and businesses need to understand that you have to put your foot put forth the, the best effort to make sure that the services are exemplary. That the uh, that the product is is stellar, and we can't rest on the laurels of certification or anything else. You need to bring the very best product to the table, and that way it stands on its own merit. Right answer. You need to have your product or service um, presented in an excellent way before you approach that opportunity. Uh, Jonathan, what would be your response to that? What do you need to have prepared before you approach the government for opportunities? So, first of all, I'll begin with the end in mind, Stephen Covey, right? So, again, we talked about a bunch of opportunities, right? But know what your sweet spot is and know what you want to do. Don't just come in and say, I want everything, right? Because then you're going to get nothing, right? So, you got to really prioritize what is it that I do well? Do I have the capital to withstand my drought? Have I talked to technical resource and assistance partners in advance of my discussion about going out for bid? Because some of this is just having that initial conversation with the SBDC to figure out, have I checked all my boxes as a business? <laughs> because in a lot of ways, what Daryl is saying is, is that where we fall short, for example, as businesses that go for grants, we're never got a certified or we're not registered as a subcontractor or we don't understand the process. So start to learn the process and we can help you. And then we can discuss, okay, how do I thread the needle on which contracting opportunity that makes sense for me? Great. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here. I'm hearing another voice on the call. Uh, if you could just mute. Sorry, Ruth, is that, yeah, let me see. Okay. So what, what I'm going to do now is ask uh, Brother Buckles the same question. What do you have to need to be preparing before making a connection with you at the McCormick Place? Well, I'm going to echo what Mr. McGee and Mr. Thomas said, which is come ready to work for sure. But then also come with a certain level of professionalism and that excellence that was also said earlier. <laughs> I think a lot of times smaller businesses, diverse businesses, um, you know, you need to understand that the people who want you to win inside the organization have to present you. Don't make us look bad. You know, when I want to tell somebody about your company and they say, what's your email? It shouldn't be John Doe at AOL.com. It should be, you know, whoever you are, your company name, professional presentation at all times. You know, that's that's one of the biggest things that I'm I'm a stickler for. If we got a if you actually get a meeting, if you actually get a chance to talk, show up on time, show up early. You know, go go above and beyond, or just you know, don't don't come in with the excuse. Well, I'm a I'm a small business, or that I didn't know. You know, especially when it comes time to submit a bid or a proposal. You know, don't I I try to be careful of my language, but you know, fill out those forms. You know, don't don't say, oh, okay, hey, I didn't know. I, do I do I really need to get that notarized? Does that really apply to me? Don't ask me these questions when it's time for the proposal to be due tomorrow. You know. Come, come ahead of the game, 
if you need some some pointers, some questions, there are a lot of different resources you can reach out to. Sometimes you can reach out to that organization if you do it in a timely fashion. So just come come prepared, come in your A game. I'm prepared with your A game. I'm gonna do one more round of questions. Um, where should uh, interested businesses, entrepreneurs start? We got a lot of information here. We got a lot of you know acronyms thrown at us. But I'll start with you, Alex. You're the last one to answer. Where should somebody interested in doing business with uh, McCormick Place? Where should they start? The Department of Procurement. I think I think that's a good starting point in in any organization that you're trying to do business with because they're the ones who know about the opportunity, whether it's current, future. Once you know about the opportunity, then you know how to approach it. Whether you got to go on a particular uh, software. You got to read the newspaper. I say start off with the Department of Procurement once you're ready to actually go for those opportunities. Uh, Jonathan, where should people start when they're interested in doing business with the Illinois Department of Transportation? Well, they should start with our supportive services consultants. Shout out to Melissa Hamilton that I know is on this call. Um, Theo Joyner as well from RGMA Associates. Um, but also start with my friends at DCEO as well, right? Because again, um, part of this is we want to make sure you're aware, right, of kind of all of the resources. And then once you're kind of ready to come to us, our consultants will help you lead the way, um, as well as my team. I have a whole team that works at IDOT that's committed to this. So um, again, if you're interested in doing business with IDOT uh, as a BEP vendor, uh, I can connect you with our BEP folks. If you want to work with the DBE program, um, I can connect you with those folks and our consultants. And then, of course, um, again, happy to, to connect and coordinate you with um, other parts of IDOT, whether that's material supplying or other opportunities. And Brother Thomas, last response from you. Where should people start on this technical assistance journey getting prepared for uh, contracting opportunities? Well, typically, we would say if they're ready to do government contracting, we say start at a P-TECH. But a lot of times, I would encourage people to start at a small business development center to make sure they understand everything that they need to do and all the resources that are available. A lot of times, businesses have a problem with contracting because of lack of capital or the ability to be able to have the funds to need it, as was stated earlier. Uh, making sure you have the capacity to be able to do government contracting business, uh, SBDC can help with that. And then uh, Erica White and I have, um, uh, State Director White and I have been working on a lot of initiatives to kind of make sure that businesses are understanding what it takes to be ready to do government contracting or PTEC ready. And so the SBDCs are working on that. And yeah, but uh, working with a with a P tech is is uh, is a great way to start because we can quickly assess whether you're ready for government contracting and then transition you back to an SBDC if that's the case. So, if you want to start with government contracting or you're interested in government contracting, you can start with a P tech and we'll make sure we get you to the right place no matter where you are. All right, with that, great, very brief, but I think a, a powerful way to end it. Simplicity at its best. Um, I love the. Uh, information you all offer to us in terms of excellence, being prepared with professional presentation, and don't walk in seeing you on everything because you'll end up with nothing. I love that. Um, what I want to do now is toss it to Vanessa Uribe for some uh, closing remarks. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, my apologies for the beginning of the panel. Um, my computer doesn't want to cooperate with me, and um, and then I'm a little under the weather, so just apologies for all of this. <laughs> um, but I just think it was such an incredible panel. Um, I learned a lot. I'm always learning a lot from each of you all and from your leadership and your expertise. Um, thank you, Jonathan, our former colleague at DCEO. It's always great to see you uh, on these events with us. Um, Alex, Daryl, Mr. Bruce Montgomery, thank you so much. Someone mentioned in the chat earlier that um, you know, you've been in the trenches with us for decades. And so we're, we're really honored to get to work alongside you um, to make sure that we continue to do the great work that you're doing. Um, Matt, you mentioned Erica White. I just, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say how proud we are uh, of her in making her story as the first black woman leading our network of small business development centers. Um, you know, she's already done a ton, a ton to make this uh, network as amazing as it is, but I know that she's doing so much more, especially so that we can be very intentional about how we support our black and brown businesses. 
Um, and then last but not least, I, you know, Matt, uh, you know how I feel about you and the amazing work that you're doing. Matt Simpson um, is really leading out for the Department of Commerce and for the state as a whole on how we can better support black owned businesses, how we can change the existing ecosystem that we know has dealt with a lot of systemic barriers uh, for, for decades, for, for centuries even. And, you know, we really need to break down those barriers and think about how we change our programs and our systems so that we can better support uh, our, our minority owned businesses. Um, I think the other thing with that is that, you know, we, we often say that we are intending to do this great work, um, but our intention doesn't always equal our impact. So, you know, we talked a lot about the way that the system works, the way that you kind of get engaged with procurement. There's a lot of resources and opportunities there to help you, um, but just know that on the back end, we're also committed to finding ways to bringing down the red tape, to ensuring that we, we're making these programs more accessible um, and not just accessible, but then we can also move the needle on, <clears throat> excuse me, on how they work for you. Um, so, you know, we learned a lot today. We learned that, you know, DCEO and our partners are doing this work, um, not just during Black Business Month, but year round. Uh, we have the right folks in place to move the needle. Um, we know that representation matters. Uh, I think Alex, you said being around matters. Um, the commission is another example of that. Uh, so, you know, putting your best Foot forward is, is the first start, um, but you have a team of folks that are here and available to assist you, um, and we want to be able to help you. So um, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. We're here for you. Uh, we're here doing the work alongside you. Uh, get connected to our resources. Take advantage of the many opportunities that we have to do the work and know that you have allies in government um, and a lot of the other spaces that we work with to ensure that you do have access and can take advantage of these opportunities. So with that, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our amazing panel and our, our group of leaders. Uh, we hope to see you again very soon. Um, and we hope to continue the conversation with each of you. So thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, everyone.